you remember better than I where we were in uh, Maccabees, but where did we finish? We didn't quite finish. I know where we were. The martyrdom episodes in two Maccabees. We saw that two Maccabees was uh, more detailed in many ways than one Maccabees, but it left off around chapter 7 of 1 Maccabees. I told you that uh, 1 Maccabees goes on and ends with someone called John Hyrcanus. So basically you have, if you want to follow Josephus' scheme, follow 1 Maccabees. He obviously knew the book or a similar book to it. You have Mattathias as a progenitor. So then he has all these sons. Jonathan, there's a John too, but he's killed, but we'll put him in here anyway. And Simon, there's an Eliezer too, I think. Uh, he's killed, these two are killed. Um, so, you see, the reason Maccabees 1 goes to Mattathias is so we can bring in the whole family. Because Jonathan has some offspring here, they're all killed. And he has some offspring here. Two of them, I think, are killed, as I recall. And then one, John hired Congress, survived. And all the rest of what you would call the Maccabean dynasty, or the Hasbonians, if you prefer, come down from him. In theory, though, it said Judas at one point settled down in uh, Maccabees 1. Uh, I think it says that. It doesn't mention any offspring. I don't think Judas ever settled down. I think he's a Kedoshim in Daniel. Saints of the Most High God in English translation. And uh, you'll get the same thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, the people who think that these are Essenes and therefore peaceful and not preparing for final war against um, uh, uh, are missing the point. So I don't see the Maccabees and the scrolls that I told you can possibly have any kind of uh, antagonism one to the other particularly. Just a few things in one Maccabee that Jonathan and Simon at some point start accepting appointment from the Seleucid dynasty. It's not in Maccabees 2, why? Because Maccabees 2 doesn't even hardly mention Jonathan or Simon, that does it. It only mentions, starts earlier with Onias, from the previous high priesthood, who is saintly, and um, a zealot for the laws, and at one point he's called the protection of his fellow countrymen. I told you that if you look at the early church descriptions of James, you'll find that he's called protection as well, in the early church text, not in the New Testament. Nobody knows what that means, but I think it harks back to this, uh, I think it's uh, Proverbs, it says, the tzaddik is the pillar of the world. Righteous one. Righteous one. What's the root of that in Zedek. Hebrew? Z-D-K. What does Z-D-K imply in Hebrew? Righteousness. What word would you get from that? Put the vowels in differently. Zed, righteousness. Put the vowels in a little differently again. Zadok the name of the first high priest. In whose time? David's time and Solomon's time. The first high priest of the first temple. Therefore, a group of people in this period are claiming descent from the first high priest of the first temple. We call them in English Sadducees. Notice the double D. But that's from a Greek word, approximating a Hebrew word. The Z has gone to S. We say Sadducee because we saw from the C in English. It's really Saduk. And that, of course, comes from Zadok, that they claim descendants from the Zadok of David's time. But Zadok in written Hebrew, those of you who know written Hebrew, my friend of the LA, Raiders hat or whatever, he probably would be able to tell you that normally speaking in ancient manuscripts, if you don't have the vowelization in, you really can't see the difference between Zadok and Zadik. Because one is the is a Yud and the other is a Vav. 
But if you know written Hebrew, a yud is written like this, and a vav is written like that. One of them would be written like that, and the other would be written like that. But actually in ancient Hebrew, they'd both be written like that, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. A Zarukite priesthood could mean a righteous priesthood. In the book that I've written, Maccabees, Zarukites, Christians, and Qumran, I try to show the progression from the Maccabean movement into the early Christian movement. And I do it around the word Sadiq, the righteous one. You know, in your Christian scripture, Jesus is supposed to be the... It's Melchizedek. And Melchizedek means righteous king, or king of righteousness. Melek in Hebrew is king. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. So that's also, if you want to see that as having to do with the priesthood, comes from just one notice in the Psalms. Uh, I forget the psalm where, where it's in, but you can look it up in, a, in a, a concordance. It's in the letter to the Hebrews. Well, that's, of course, where, where it should be. Someone's writing a letter to the Hebrews using their concepts. And at one point, Hebrew says, he is a high priest of higher purity, or of higher righteousness. So that's another, basically, Zadokite claim, but not the same as the Sadducees are making. I mean, the Sadducees in the New Testament are not in the Maccabean period here. We're in the Herodian period. We call the Maccabean period everything from Judas Maccabee down to the storming of the temple by the Romans, 63 B.C. Who is the Roman general who storms the temple? Pompey, Caesar's associate, erstwhile a colleague, later they fight a civil war against each other. That's what the people who assassinate Caesar have against Caesar, because he defeats Pompey. Pompey is conquering countries in the east, Asia Minor, Syria, finally Palestine, Egypt. He's, he gets killed in, uh, later on in Egypt when someone takes his head to Caesar and Caesar's very upset by that. And that's in the 60s BC down to the 40s BC. When is Caesar assassinated? These he dead dates. 44 BC, Augustus, Octavian, takes over in the war against Mark Antony. That's around 33 BC. I think the Battle of Actium is actually 31 B.C. But anyway, uh, Octavius, he becomes Augustus. Or is he just a little sort of upstart boy? He's Caesar's nephew or grandnephew. I can't remember which. Anyway, he's adopted by Caesar, supposedly. He claims that Caesar adopted him before he was killed. And then he used that to fight Antony, who was Caesar's uh, you know, main uh, lieutenant general and so on. Let's come back here. How do we get Sadducee? Through the Greek. The New Testament and Josephus are written in Greek. The New Testament probably gets it from Josephus. You know, so did they know it themselves? No, I don't think they knew much. And I think they got most of their historical data from Josephus. Uh, maybe, I mean, you won't find anything about a Sadducee in Paul's letters or anything like that. Now, he doesn't know, he doesn't speak about Sadducees, speak about Pharisees. So anyway, what would Maccabees 1 be then, in terms of these party groups that are appearing here? Probably a Sadducee book, but not a Sadducee book of the kind of the New Testament, because it's a resistant Sadducee book think of the Maccabees as righteous priests? Again, to go back to the Jesus thing, a priest after the order of Melchizedek for Christianity, Jesus is king, right? And also high priest. That's what Hebrews is saying. He has a dual role. Well, if you're reading Maccabees 1, Jonathan gets appointment from the Seleucids as what? King. And he's also high priest. So there you have the dual role right there presaging the first century A.D. with a Christian attachment. So this king high priest starts with the Maccabean family. Anyway, Judas in uh, Maccabees 2 
is given a messianic battle sword at the end from Onias and Jeremiah. Let's go back to Maccabees 2. You see, um, after the people in the caves who don't defend themselves on the Sabbath in chapter 6 are wiped out, and Maccabees 1, as you recall, has the ruling that Mattathias makes that we must defend ourselves on the Sabbath, otherwise we will all be wiped out. So Maccabees 1 answers that question and gives the answer to that question to Mattathias, its progenitor of the family. I'm not sure how uh, Maccabees 2 handles that issue, it's just they realize that they have to defend themselves on this Sabbath. So right after they're wiped out in 6, 1 to 11, we get 18. This is where we left off last time. Eliezer, one of the foremost teachers of the law, already advanced in years, but would not eat swine flesh, whatever, following the law. But rather, 19, he resolved to die with honor, then live disgraced. Um, most people tried to urge him to do this because the king had demanded that this was the way now this is, I'm not sure here's another one of those episodes is this an historical episode or a literary episode same as Jesus and others I think this is a literary episode but it doesn't matter the point of the episode is to do what but having taken a noble decision line 20 Three, worthy of his years, and the dignity of his great age, and the well-earned distinction of his gray hairs, worthy too of his impeccable conduct from boyhood, and above all, the holy legislation or law established by God himself. So, this book wouldn't get on too well with Paul. That, I want to keep pointing it out to you, because to me that is the whole crux. What's going on in this prayer? The crux between those willing to die for the law and, and those willing to abandon it and go over to Roman Hellenistic lifestyle and way of life. You say, what, that, the New Testament's about that? In the context of this period in Palestine, yes. Because the context of this period in Palestine, as the gospel is presented, I'm not sure they're historical. Jesus basically abolishes the law. But Jesus' followers don't seem to understand that he has. And in fact, only Paul seems to know that he's done this. Because when Peter is supposed to eat with a Gentile, as I've told you in Acts 10 or so, when the Roman centurion sends a messenger to him, Peter says, oh no, I have never eaten any unclean thing or with any unclean person. The point I'm trying to make, whether it's talking or not, if Jesus had taught that, Peter, of course, associate, should understand. But he doesn't. At least that's what Acts knows, that he doesn't. The only one who understands this is Paul. Paul in 1 Corinthians says that uh, for me, for me, there, there are no unlawful things. And in Romans we hear the law he recognizes is Roman. And elsewhere he calls people who follow the law, worry about the forbidden foods, he calls them weak in both. Romans and Corinthians, that's why it's necessary to read Paul. He says, some people are so weak, they'll do what? Only eat vegetables. Only eat vegetables because you're so interested in purity matters, you're basically following the law, and therefore like Judas Maccabee here, you'll only eat vegetation things because you're not even sure if the sacrifice has been, you know, is valid anymore. And who is the big vegetarian? Well, of course, the leader of the Jerusalem church, James. It's an attack on James. I'm only saying, what Eliezer says is 180 degrees opposite to what the Pauline letters say. Because James and Peter don't understand what Paul seems to understand. You know, James' followers are zealous for the law, Galatians says. When James' followers, Galatians chapter 2, come down to Antioch, Peter stopped keeping table fellowship with Gentiles for fear of the party of the circumcision, those who were putting circumcision attachment to the law first, which was the leadership of the whole church. So, if the leadership of the whole, and then Peter, uh, Paul calls Peter and Barnabas hypocrites in chapter 2 of Galatians. I don't have time to read all that. And Paul, don't forget, is an enemy of Christians, an enemy who persecuted Christians, some even unto death. 
and suddenly he has visionary experiences that get him into what we presently call Christianity. But to make it clear here, uh, but you have to change, they say, otherwise you'll be killed. But Eliezer, 90 years old, uh, refused to conform to the foreigner's way of life. Um, and, and he talks about being led astray, and the scrolls talk about being led astray by someone who teaches against the law. Even though for the moment I avoid the execution by men, I can never, living or dead, elude the grasp of the Almighty. Therefore, if I, I am a man, to quit this life, even though I'm 90 years old, here and now I shall prove myself worthy of my old age, and I shall have left the young a noble example of how to make a good death. Here we go. How to make a good death. This is a new idea in this paragraph. And I will eagerly and generously for the venerable and holy law. These are the first martyrs. We don't have an idea of martyrs. So, well, Christians are martyrs. Yeah, yeah, that's true, but that comes later. We're already having martyrs in the second century BC. This is the new doctrine coming in with Daniel, the holy war, resurrection of the dead, the Maccabean uprising, because you'll admit these are part and parcel of the Maccabean uprising. Let's look at the rest of these martyrdom materials here. Uh, so uh, he then said, this is how he died, 31, leaving by his death an example of nobility and record of virtue, not only for the young, but for the great majority of the nation. Um, I don't think rabbinic Judaism, though, normally has a lot of emphasis on this aspect of Judaism. Not the Phariseeism of Josephus or Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is the founding moment of Rabbinic Judaism. He's an interesting character. He's related to some of the um, insurgents in the city. The Talmudic literature tells us that. Rabbi Yochanan's nephew was the head of the insurgents who had a hold of the city in the 70 AD uprising period. But he, as Talmudic liter literature proudly proclaims around three or four different places, has himself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin, the only way he could get out alive, with his disciples, two of his disciples. Um, and uh, even the episodes say that the Romans pierced, pierced the casket, they pierced our master, but they didn't get to the they didn't, they weren't able to do it. He wasn't really dead. He was just acting, and his nephew who said gave him a pass to leave. And then he had an arrow shot in Vespasian's camp. It's all quasi history. Because Vespasian wasn't there at this time. His son Titus was. But anyway, it's pseudo, it's, it gives you the point. Saying, Rabbi Yochanan is a friend of the emperor. And then he's ushered into because Vespasian, is the general in Jerusalem, is becoming emperor. He's ushered into Vespasian's camp. It was all in the town, but in three or four places. That's my friend who vouched for that. And he, he is um, ushered into Vespasian's camp, and he applies the Messianic prophecy, the holiest prophecy of the Jewish people at that time, that a star would rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world, to Vespasian, Numbers 24, 17, found in three documents in the known Qumran texts. So far, we found that three, so it shows the Dead Sea Scrolls were interested in the star prophecy. Star prophecy, I told you about it before. Numbers 24, 17. Star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world. And um, he says, you are the star that will rise from Palestine to rule the world. This basis. So he applies the star prophecy to the conqueror of Palestine and the destroyer of the temple and the burner of Jerusalem. Well, that's pretty cynical. What's he get in return? A school at Yavne, where we now, where Judaism is created. Yavne is a town down near the coast. You'll see it written like this or like this. Now, these are the Pharisees that move into rabbinic Judaism, the normal Judaism that we know today. But this is not apocalyptic Judaism or messianic Judaism as such. Because these people would not do this. These people would die. And they all did. Qumran people all died. That's why they couldn't come back to get the manuscripts or became slaves. The Masada people all committed suicide. 
Josephus when he was in the cave. What happened only when he was in the cave? They drew lots. And <laughs> Josephus and his friend drew the short straws. They killed all the others, and then he went out and surrendered to the to the Romans. Got adopted into the royal family, as we told you, and uh, became Flavius Josephus and wrote the histories that we're using. These people survived. They didn't go the route of Eliezer. So the, the Judaism that we're talking about here in the Maccabean period, Sadducees were originally like this. Now what kind of Sadducees are they? That's what we call them Zadokites. That's why I have the book Maccabees, Zadokites, Christians, and Qumran. Because these Zadokites are not later Sadducees in the Herodian period. Now when the Romans stormed the temple in 63 B.C., we'll see in Josephus that they're really amazed by the priests in the temple. How many got that far? What do the priests do? 63 B.C. They go about their sacrifices as if nothing is happening. And they're cut down by the Romans, but Josephus admits, because he's not writing himself, he's writing from sources, he can't lie here, the source is telling him that they're actually cut down by people of the opposite party who turn out to be the Pharisees who are cooperating with the Romans to take the temple from these people. So I, what I'm trying to tell you is the people who are cut down here and all butchered in the first uh, Roman assault on the temple under Pompeii, it's all in your Josephus if you're reading, are these Sadducees who are not yet uh, Hellenized. Herodian us. They're all killed in this period. Or go into hiding. Or get like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And a new Sadducee group comes in. Who I think you have to call Herodian Sadducees. So there's a split in the Sadducee movement that takes place somewhere in the Herodian period. Now Herod's father we'll get here in Josephus, will be involved in the Roman takeover of the temple in 63 B.C. And somewhere in the 40s to the 30s, Herod comes to power and supplants the Maccabees. And Herod's father, Josephus will tell us, is an Idumean Greek or what we would call an Arab, from a fam mixed family. From his, uh, one side is a priest in a temple of Apollo in Gaza, and the other side are Edomans or Edomites from the city of Petra, the royal line in Petra. And Herod's father's intermediary between these people, what we would call Arabs at that time, and the Romans, and they will help the Roman take over Palestine in 63 B.C. And the Pharisees will cooperate with that. So we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I'm trying to tell you who these, how these parties are created. So there's a group of Sadducees before that, and Josephus tells you that Herod never stopped taking vengeance on these people who resisted him and would not give in to him. And he had spies everywhere. People were taken in secret, like John the Baptist, and, and tortured and beheaded. He was a Incipient Saddam Hussein or Joe Stalin or something like that is absolutely insane maniac. And not only did he kill everyone who did not agree to his takeover, which are all these previous people, he killed all the Maccabean family. He killed the Maccabeans who cooperated with them. He killed one of the Maccabeans who was married, ultimately forcibly married to him. He killed his own sons by that woman who he had forcibly married. Uh, probably the deal was that her brother should keep the high priesthood. We'll get all that. Her brother, her name is First Mary, Mariam, Miriam, Mary, First Mary, in the 30s. And I'm sure that her killing gave rise to all the Marys you get in the New Testament, because you don't name someone Mary if you don't admire the previous Mary. She's the Maccabean princess that Herod kills. 
you've been reading your Josephus, this should be popping up into your, into your uh, mindset. Uh, but in addition, she kills, he kills her brother, Jonathan, her brother's name was. Another Jonathan named after the Maccabean early progenitors. And I think the deal was that her brother would be high priest if she married Herod. So they would keep the high priesthood in the Maccabean family. But when he became of age, as Hera, as Josephus tells you, uh, the people all cried when he put the priestly vestments on. Now, that in itself will show you that the Maccabeans were the popular priesthood and the popular party. Not the Pharisees that rabbinic literature tries to make out they being the descendants of the Pharisees. No, the Pharisees were promoted by the Romans when they took the temple in 70 AD. And then the Pharisee patriarchs became the Roman tax collectors in Palestine. Fair enough. That was the deal that Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, made with the Roman authorities. That he would get the academy and so on if he recognized Roman power in Palestine. But these other people were not prepared to recognize any foreign powers. That's why I'm doing this Eliezer thing. He shows how to make a good death. In any case, <coughs> this Mary, Miriam, or so on, Herod's Maccabean wife, that you, a lot of Josephus is, is, uh, is uh, dedicated to, telling her story and so on. When, when the people all cry, when he takes the vestments at 12 or 13, I think 13 or so, Herod takes, has his henchmen take him down to a pool in Jericho, which he had, I've been to that palace, and drowned. And uh, that's probably the end of the deal. But see, Herod couldn't be a high priest because he was a farmer. So anyway, the Herodian period begins here in the 63 BC period. We have several foreign depredations on the temple. One in the Maccabean period, which Judas had to deal with. That would be around 163, 167, somewhere in there. Then 63 BC, Pompeii. But that isn't the end of it. 37 BC, Herod storms the temple again with, with Roman troops and takes the people who would not acknowledge him as a king appointed by the Romans. And then finally, 66 to 70 AD, the war against Rome that Josephus outlines for us. The Romans take the temple in 70 AD. So you have three Roman storming of the temple. 63 BC, 37 BC, and 66 to 70 CE or AD. Okay? So let's go back to Eliezer. He showed how to make a good death for the holy legislation. These are the people who will not compromise, who will not accept foreign rule, who will not accept high priests appointed by foreigners, who will not accept Roman taxation in Palestine. You say they're nuts? Yeah, they are. Uh, they, they will not give in. They prefer death. And this is the martyrdom ethic that we're going to get. And it comes out of the Daniel books and the Maccabean uprights. So here's the next one, chapter 7. Seven brothers arrested with their mother. Again, the king tried to force them to do what? Seven, one, two, eat pig flesh. What are you trying to do? We would rather than die than break the law of our forefathers. That will be in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the law of the forefathers. Again, I contrast it to the fall thing. So I want you to see that we have 250 years of struggle against the kind of thing that fall represents. Christ, whoever he was, would probably like these Jews who were willing to die rather than renounce things. It's, again, it's because the Jews were so messianic in this period that they lost everything. Josephus, at the end of the Jewish war, says the thing that most moved our young men to revolt against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. 
So he shows at the end of the Jewish war that actually the war against Rome was a messianic war. He says, these, <laughs> these poor people, their interpretation was mistaken. They thought it applied to one of their own. But the uh, prophecy was uh, capable of multiple interpretations. It actually applied to Vespasian, who came out of Palestine and ruled the world. So Josephus has the Pharisee interpretation of Rabbi Yochanan and himself. I think the Pharisees take it from Josephus. I don't think Rabbi Yochanan actually did what that episode show him to do. I think Josephus was the first person to, to do that. When he surrendered to the Romans in Galilee, he went before Vespasian. He did go before Vespasian. And he did say, you are the world ruler that will come out of Palestine to uh, rule the world. So the world ruler of prophecy was in the air at that time. Now, Christianity thinks it is a native Jew or a God Jew that is this person. And the, the Jews who fought this war thought that too, but I don't know how Jesus would. He tells you his sources. If you're reading just he was, he tells you his sources. One source is um, uh, what's his name, a Herodian sort of official. Um, I can't remember his name. Let me go back to this uh, martyrdom episode. So we we are prepared to die rather than break the law. And the mother now encourages one after the other to die nobly like Eliezer for the laws. And here's what she says to them. The Lord God, but the people, this is to encourage Martha. The Lord God is watching, and surely he takes pity on his servants. Uh, and so the first came, and the uh, ruler says, Will you eat before we torture your body limb by limb? Never! He too was tortured. With his last breath he exclaimed, in human fiend you may discharge us from the present life, but the king of the world will raise us up, since it is for his laws that we die to live again forever. That is the most specific statement of the resurrection doctrine in any book so far. And it is in the context of martyrdom. So, it's for his laws he will raise them up again. The second one comes. It is heaven that gave me these limbs, line 11, for the sake of his laws I disdain them, for I hope to receive them back again. Then the fourth one, savage torture. Ours is a better choice to meet death at men's hands, yet relying on God's promise that we shall be raised up by him. Whereas for you there can be no resurrection, no new life. Look at that. That's a little different than Daniel. It isn't everyone is being raised and the good go to heaven and the bad go to eternal torture. In, in this book, only the righteous are raised, the rest stay dead. A slightly different concept of, of resurrection. I think this is very primitive. I think this is probably the original concept. I think heaven and hell is a later literary uh, evolution from this. But you have to understand, what date is this supposed to be around, 175? This is going to go on from 175 to 70 A.D. That's 250 years, and on again to 136 in the Bar Kokhba War. So actually, it's 300 years of struggle, older than the United States. You don't know what that means. You don't know what these people went through. Nobody can understand. I try to teach these courses, try to make people take it seriously. What was going on in this prayer? What? We were dealing with what they were doing, where these concepts came from, by picking out the passages that people always ignore. Anyway, she says, I don't know how you appeared in my womb. I didn't endow you with life and breath. I didn't shape you, line 22 to 23, of every part. It's the creator of the world, ordaining the process of man's birth and presiding over the origin of all things, who in his mercy must surely give you back both breath and life, seeing that you now despise your own existence, for the sake of his laws. And then what? Paul comes along and says, oh, I have some visions, and you're supposed to accept these? Ma, never, never, <coughs> never happened in Palestine. So therefore, people who object to the Jews attacking Paul, they had no choice. You can't object to their attacking him in the temple or the Jews that in Acts who take an oath, uh, a Nazarite oath, not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. I know that the book of Acts makes those Jews look like they're horrible people. No, 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 they're not horrible people in this context. 
Look at the rest of her speech. Line 27. My son have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb. Suckled you three years. Fed you. Reared you to the heaven. This is in the Catholic Bible, by the way, not in the Jewish Bible. And acknowledge that God made them out of what did not exist. Creatio ex nihil. Creatio out of nothing. It's a famous philosophical theory. They knew it in the second century B.C. Of what did not exist. And mankind comes in the same way. So don't fear this executioner. Prove yourself worthy of your brothers. Make death welcome so on the day of mercy I may receive you back in your, in your mother's company. That's another important idea. Those people who don't understand what Masada is about. But the people he calls Sikari, the extreme zealots, took over Masada, which was a fortress by the Dead Sea. It had been a Herodian armory. And they held out there, thinking the Romans wouldn't come after them. And the Romans came after them, besieged the place for three years, used prisoners to build a ramp, and they were going to storm the place. There were a thousand men, women, and children there, and to see was the test, they all committed suicide uh, the, the night before the Romans were going to storm the place. Um, I think also they left the stores there so that they could show they, they, they didn't commit suicide because they were out of supplies. They made a good dad. But even more than that, they followed this book or these ideas in this kind of book because I think their ideology was this. Why kill the women and children? Because they wanted to see each other again after the resurrection. And if they hadn't killed the women and children themselves before they were polluted by being sold into slavery and given to brothels, in addition, in the archaeological excavation done on Masada, they found the bones passage from Ezekiel buried under the floor of the synagogue there. Uh, but the doyen of Israeli archaeologist, whose name was Egal Yadin, he, he, he's written a lot of books on he excavated Masada. He has no comment to make about finding the bones passage from Ezekiel underneath the synagogue floor. What? Are you kidding me? There is a comment to make. These people believed in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they buried that passage underneath the synagogue floor. That's what they believed in, and that's why they committed suicide. Okay. Uh, finally, she says, Our brothers, line 36, after enduring their brief pain, now drink of ever-flowing life by virtue of God's covenant. I guess it's the, uh, it's the brother talking. I too, like my brother, surrender my body and life, line 37, for the laws of my ancestors, call on God to show kindness to our nation. The king found a rage, treated this one more cruelly than the others, because he was smarting from the young man's scorn. And so the last of brothers met his, and undefiled with perfect trust in the Lord, the mother was the last to die after her son. Okay, I've only read all that. Why? to show you the ethos of the period and where martyrdom and resurrection of the dead first come in. These doctrines pass into Christianity and into Islam. And it all, I think, the first, in the first place that it happened is right here in the 6th century BC in Palestine in this movement that we've been watching here. Okay, Judas Maccabee, chapter 8. Made their way secretly among the villages, rallying the kinsfolk, recruiting those loyal to Judaism, assembled 6,000. They purified the temple and so on. So, uh, chapter 10, they restored the temple. Uh, the day of the purification of the temple, line 10.5, came. On the very day the temple had been profaned by the foreigners, the 25th of Kislev, like 25th of December. They kept eight festal days with rejoicing in the manner of the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering how, not long before at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, they had been living in the mountains and caverns like wild beasts. That's why they keep eight days of Hanukkah. Not because of the miraculous candles and rabbinic Judaism or whatever. It's because they took eight days of the Sukkot Tabernacles that commemorates the wilderness sojourn of Moses and applied it to their wilderness sojourn. These are the first wilderness sojourners who are fighting in the way of God in the wilderness. They also decreed by public edict, ratified by vote, that the whole Jewish nation should celebrate these same days every year. Not God-given, ratified by vote of the nation. This is all new stuff. 
This is not Moses on Sinai. This is ratified by blood. In chapter 12, 40, there was a problem with some of the people had idols uh, under their uh, armor, some of the uh, soldiers. Um, and Judas urged the people to keep themselves free from sin. So he collected a collection and sent it to Jerusalem to have the sacrifice for sin offered. For if he had not expected the fallen to rise again, it would have been a superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Whereas if he had in view the splendid recompense reserved for those who make a pious end, the thought was holy and devout. This was why he had this atonement sacrifice offered for the dead, so they might be released from this uh, sin that they had committed. So the point is that again, resurrection of the uh, of the dead for those who make a pious end. Uh, chapter 14 picks up uh, where we have it, things in Maccabees 7 that we did last time, where the Hasidans are now mentioned. I think this may be the first time the Hasidans are mentioned in Maccabees 2. Maccabees 1, the Hasidans are mentioned twice. Once when they volunteered to join Mattathias and Judas, each a brave stout uh, uh, fighting man for the law. Second time in chapter 7, when I read you last time when we broke, that uh, Alchemus, former high priest, according to 14.3 here, willfully incurred defilement at the time of the insurrection, uh, had come with a Seleucid appointment, and uh, they went over to Alchemus, according to Maccabees 1. According to Maccabees 2, not true. Those Jews called Hasidans, say this Alchemus, uh, who are led by Judas Maccabee, line 6, are warmongers and rebels who are preventing the kingdom from finding stability. Uh, as long as Judas remains alive, the state will enjoy no peace, he says to this lucid ruler. Do I believe that speech? It sounds reasonable. So the Hasidans are the followers of Judas Parsifal. In Daniel's terms, they are the saints of the Most High God. They are the holy ones of the Most High God. So my solution to this in Maccabees, Zadokai's Christians in Qumran, that book, is that to say, Okay, which is right, Maccabees 2 or Maccabees 1? Let's assume they're both right. Because the, uh, the Pharisees do claim that they're descended also from Hasidim. And many people think that the word Pharisee uh, has something to do with the word Hasidim. But it doesn't. Pharisee in Hebrew means to break away, to split. So I propose this theory, it's not proven, that at in this period, there were Pharisee Hasidans. I use two S's to keep the parallel with Zadik, as I told you. And let's call them the new word we've discovered, Zadokai Hasidans. And that both descended from the Hasidan movement that believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believe, even to this day, rabbinic Judaism believes in the resurrection of the dead. Christianity believes in resurrection of the of, of, of the dead. Supposedly the Sadducees according to Josephus didn't. But the Sadducees we're looking at here do. That is, if we can call them Sadducees in the Maccabean period. Whatever the group, see ultimately this group is going to become, I think, Essenes and Zealots. The Maccabean group is going to become Essenes and Zealots. We haven't talked about the other groups, Essenes and Zealots. And zealots also have an extreme wing, as I've told you now, Sikari, which comes from the knife, supposedly, that they carry to kill their opponents. Or, to use the language of the New Testament in James, party of the circumcision making. I said, suppose they're both true. Two groups of Hasidans. What's the difference between the two groups? This group will not accept foreign rule in Palestine. This group will. This group will not accept foreign appointment of high priests, but prefers a more native uh, uh, procedure. Uh, election on the basis of righteousness. This group, all it, all it needs is that you're from a proper genealogy of some kind. But their only family is the Herodian family, and the Romans were willing to live with. They were not revolutionary families, resistance families. They were collaborating families. You understand what is emerging here? Start with the Hasidim. Then think of a split in the Hasidim movement. Some people stick with Judas Maccabee. They're the normative Hasidim. Some people will go away and become the Pharisees. The Pharisees aren't in existence yet, but they're the breakaway Hasidim. 
who are willing to live with foreign power and control in Palestine. So at Qumran, the opponents of the Dead Sea Scrolls, I told you last time, are called seekers after smoothness. In Phariseeism, you are looking after halakhot, not halakhot. Smooth things is hal halakhot. Halakhot is legal traditions, oral traditions, supposedly going back to Moses. New legislative material to add to the law of Moses. So, to my mind, the Qumran group are making fun of this procedure of the Pharisees to seek halakhot. Say, no, it has to be written documents has to be only the written documents, no oral law, as in Phariseeism, no new traditions, etc., 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 etc. But it's not just little nitpicking little things, it's big things. I told you, foreign appointment of high priests, foreign rule in Palestine, marriage with nieces. At Qumran it becomes polygamy too. Phariseeism accepts polygamy, Qumran did not. Uh, Phariseeism accepts marriage with uh, nieces, Qumran did not, and so on and so on. And I think the attack on marriage with nieces and polygamy is actually an attack on the Herodians. Because it's Herod who had ten wives. And the Qumran documents uh, say you are not to multiply wives, the ruler is not to multiply wives unto himself. That's an attack on the Herodian family, not the Maccabeans who didn't really do this. They didn't have numerous wives. And marriage with nieces is the Herodian family policy. So to me, that one thing alone in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the ban on marriage with nieces is an attack on the Herodian family. And that shows we're attacking the Herodian priesthood that is permitting these things to the Herodian family. So to my mind, the scrolls are anti-Herodian documents, but um, we have another martyrdom episode quick. Razis, line 37, R-A-Z-I-S. In his early days, the insurrection had been convicted of Judaism. He risked both body and life for Judaism with the utmost zeal. Another zealot, another one who will not compromise. In any case, finally, when the Nicanor forces come in, he sees himself surrounded on all sides and falls on his sword, nobly resolving, line 42, to die rather than fall in the clutches of these villains and suffer the outrages of his noble birth. But in the heat of conflict, he missed the thrust, and the troops swarmed through the doorways. He ran up to a wall and threw himself down among the troops. So he wounded himself, he threw himself down, but even then he didn't die. Still breathing, blazing anger, he struggled to his feet, blood spurting in all directions. Despite his terrible wounds, he ran right through the crowd, then taking his stand on a steep rock, although he had now lost every drop of blood he had, he tore out his entrails and taking them in both hands, flung them among the troops. Uh, I think this is a literary episode, okay? <laughs> Calling on the master of life, but we understand what's being said, and spirit to give them back to him one day. Again, resurrection of the dead. Well, look, am I right? Is this encouraging martyrdom for the law? I think that we can safely say that that is certainly true. The rest of the book we've already read, so we can close the book on that and just summarize for the break as follows. We have two movements developing here, or three, coming out of this Hasidian movement. The reason I know that the ones who cooperate with foreign power are the Pharisees is that if you look in your Josephus, the first time he really mentions Pharisees are in the next generation down, uh, when he's talking about um, John Hyrcanus's children. He mentions it a little bit under John Hyrcanus. But under John Hyrcanus' children, he mentions, the genealogy goes, John Hyrcanus, <coughs> and then Alexander Yanias. By this time, they're having two names, Greek and Hebrew. Yanias is Java. So John Argana, John is a Hebrew name, whether you know it or not, it's Yochanan, and it, uh, the H is kept in the Hebrew as we. So Simon would be around, oh, uh, I suppose 140 BC, or one somewhere in there he would die. John Arcanus is maybe down to 110 BC. Alexander Janias takes it down to 70 BC. 
But when Alexander is king, Demetrius is the king, another Demetrius, in um, the Seleucid uh, area. And some people want him to come in, and uh, uh, some of the Jews go, go to Demetrius and say they don't like Alexander. Um, why don't you uh, bring an army in here? And so when he does that, this Demetrius, uh, the people turn against the Jews who were inviting the foreigners into the country. At that point, Alexander, who'd been taken to the hills and the, and the wilderness, takes 800 prisoners and impaled them or crucified them in the middle of the city. These were people who were of the opposite group. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're going to get reference to this. In a document called the Nahum Pesher, we're going to hear about the furious young lion who crucified a lot of these seekers after smooth things. Now, how do we know that these are Pharisees that he did this to? Because in the next page it talks about Alexander's death and that his wife actually was a Pharisee and so on and so forth and how the Pharisees governed her. And they wanted to take vengeance on, on Alexander Unias' people because he had crucified their compatriots, their Pharisee compatriots. And then in the next generation, we find that when the Romans take the temple in 63 BC, that these priests went about their offerings as if nothing was happening. But most who fell were killed by their own countrymen of the rival faction the people that brought the Roman power into the country, and once again, it's the Pharisees. We will pick up there, and we'll uh, uh, read through Josephus. What I'm trying to show you is the sectarian situation in Palestine is more complicated than most people think. And it's not just so easy to say, Pharisees, Sadducees. The Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, because the party that is really the Jesus party are the Essenes. Now, we haven't even mentioned Essenes yet because they haven't appeared yet on our radar scope. But we've heard about Essenes because we've heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we know that everyone talks about the Essenes being the people who are responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have to, if I say Essenes wrote the scrolls, then I have to judge Essenes, what Essenes are, by what the scrolls are, not vice versa. Scrolls have an idea of resurrection of the dead. But the scrolls also have an idea of final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth. And extremely militant. Most of those people who were able to deal with the scrolls in the, from 48 to uh, 67 were basically mostly Christian monks. So most people's idea of Essenes are a retiring, peaceful group in the wilderness, sort of like a monastic group. That's how the original scholars who presented them tried to portray them. But that's not the essence of the scroll. And that's not this movement we're seeing in the Judas Maccabee period either. These people are much more aggressive than that. So uh, we're building the context for the scrolls. Let's then finish it up by looking at Josephus chapter 1. Now before I look at chapter 1, it's always useful to look at prefaces. The war of the Jews against the Romans was the greatest of our time. Greater too, perhaps, this is the preface, than any recorded struggle, whether between cities or nations. Okay. <coughs> right away we know that Josephus is what? An exaggerator. But why does he want to build it up big? He says at one point, people who have uh, small, minor enemies, can't show their greatness. To show your greatness, you have to have great enemies. So to praise Titus and Vespasian, who are the ultimate object of this book, to ingratiate himself and to get their favor, the Jews, the, the war has to be a big thing. It has to be as big as uh, Julius Caesar's uh, Gallic War. Julius Caesar's civil war. He's building these people up as the new emperors after Julius Caesar. Listen to what he says next. Yet persons with no first hand knowledge, excepting baseless and inconsistent stories on hearsay, have written garbled accounts, while those of eyewitnesses have been falsified. 
either to flatter the Romans or vilify the Jews. Now, that's already in his time, three years after the war occurred. People are already falsifying their accounts. Now, I know you don't like when I say these things. Nobody ever does. And I don't like having to say them. But to my mind, that's what's going on in some of the Gospels in the book of Acts. The vilification of the Jews and the flattery of the Romans. When the Roman centurions accept Christ and recognize Christ before his own people do. When Roman centurions want Peter to come to their house uh, and visit them and give piously to um, Jewish causes. To me, that's all what Josephus is saying here. That is not what went on in Palestine. The Roman the Roman centurions from the Caesarean reg regiments, Josephus makes quite clear, were the most brutal of all the regiments, and they provoked the Jews to revolt against Rome. And then Josephus himself, you think he's above that? He does the same thing in the end. You have to read, that's how powerful this is. You, you know, in order to survive in the Roman Empire, you better fly to the Romans or you're on the chopping block, you know. And uh, even he, you know, uh, he said Titus always begged the people to surrender before so that he wouldn't have to kill them all, so they wouldn't have to fire the cities, and they always ignored his pleas to surrender. So afterwards, he butchered everyone and bur burned their cities, <laughs> you know, or sold them all into slavery. I mean, you know, that's just the vilification and flattery. And Josephus does it all the time. So for the benefit of the emperor's subjects, I've decided to translate into Greek the books which I wrote some time ago uh, in his native language for circulation in the Middle East. I myself, Josephus, son of Matthias, again, we have the, uh, Ma uh, the Maccabean names, and he says he descend he's a descendant of some branch of the Maccabeans at one point in his autobiography. And a priest from Jerusalem. In the early stages I fought against the Romans, the later events I was an unwilling witness. What does it mean he was an unwilling witness? He was a captive, uh, and um, basically he was an interrogator of prisoners. And um, one episode, as I think I told you about, when he's uh, sent between the, the two lines on the siege of Jerusalem so that he can speak to the people on the ramparts. Uh, he's trying to get them to surrender. Somehow he's hit by a missile and falls down. And he says, he admits, I think it's in the autobiography, a great cheer went up from the ramparts when they thought their enemy Josephus was dead. So <laughs> that shows how popular he was in Palestine. And um, he saved his life and succeeded extremely, <laughs> extremely well. He, he lived while all the others died. You know, if you read the Vita, which you should read, it's very short, he, go, he, 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 he goes into the city after it fell. And he asked Titus, the son of Vespasian, if he could have some prisoners who were already up on crosses being crucified because they were friends of his. And uh, Titus gives them to him. He goes and takes down some friends of his from, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, cross. So don't think Jesus is the only one being crucified in this prayer. That's what the Romans did to people that they wanted to make an exemplary punishment. Anyway, the upheaval, as I said, was the greatest of all time. Rome was in a very unsettled state. Jewish revolutionaries took advantage of the general disturbance. They had vast resources of men and money. How come? Who helped them? My theory is that this queen of, of northern Syria, her name is Queen Helen of Adiabini, was actually one of the moving forces behind the revolt. She's in the Talmud, she's in uh, the Antiquities, she's not really in the war. But she was totally behind Jewish causes. Her sons were among the first uh, to die in the first engagements of the war against Rome. They were converts, Orthodox converts to um, Judaism. and. Uh, Vast resources of men and money, I think, came from that family. And so there was widespread ferment, uh, and the Jews expected all their Mesopotamian brethren to join them, you see. And so this book is written to discourage the Mesopotamian brethren and others in that area from involving themselves in Palestine. 
and the Parthians, Babylonians, remotest Arabians, Babylonian Jews, Assyrians, and so on, thanks to my labors, were accurately informed of the causes of the war. And they wouldn't be deluded with flattery or fiction. But I, I must show my impartiality. I must permit myself to bewail my country's tragedy. She was destroyed by eternal dissensions, and the Romans who so unwillingly set fire to the temple, he admits the Romans burned the temple, were brought in by the Jews' self-appointed rulers as Titus Caesar, the temple's destroyer, has testified. That is rubbish. That is not the Jews' self-appointed leaders, as we'll see all through this course I'm reading between the lines. The people who invited the Romans in were the authorities that the Romans appointed over the country. All the revolutionary Jews were not into inviting the Romans into the country, and they were the mass of the people. The revolution was popular. So that is just rubbish, what he says. That's what I mean. You take Josephus, but you can read through it. And that's what I think you have to try to do. The point being that some people only believe what they read. No, you have to read through the lines. But you see, he hates the gangs of bandits, as he calls them. The revolutionaries for him are bandits. So let's get to the end of this and get to the history. Starting with Antiochus Epiphanes, who stormed Jerusalem after holding it for three and a half years, there's the uh, three and a half years of Daniel, was driven out of the country by the Asmonians. I shall explain how their descendants, by their struggles for their... The throne forced Pompey and the Romans to intervene. Look at that one. What Pompey doing in the far in the Middle East anyway? How did they force him to intervene? Okay. So again, he's this. He considers this to be even-handed. You can imagine how bad the others were if this is supposed to be even-handed. Finally, he says in the last paragraph, "I have to hurry." Then I shall contrast the brutality of the, of, of, of the party chief towards their countrymen with the clemency of the Romans towards aliens. It means the party chiefs, the people in Palestine arguing with each other and inflicting brutality on, on each other, not the Roman armies. They're the opponents of clemency towards aliens. This is just such rubbish. You know, it, Josephus has a particular axe to grind here. His good friend, who he talks about in the Vita, uh, also called Jesus, Ben Gamala, a high priest around the 60s AD. And when the revolutionaries butchered all the high priests after the death of James, and I say that the reason they did that was because of the destruction of James by the high priests. I think James was part of the revolutionary party, is what I'm trying to get at. But anyway, when he starts mentioning zealots in the 66, when the outbreak of the war, the first thing they do is they bring in these foreign uh, sympathizers called the Idumeans who help them, and they go through the city and they kill all the high priests. And among them is Josephus' friend, Jesus ben Gamala, but they also kill the person who killed James, Ananus ben Ananus. They kill them and threw their bodies outside of the walls without burial naked body as food for jackals. Now, something caused them to be angry like that. Now, the first Ananus was actually mentioned in the Gospels as at the trial of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, so the father of this Ananus is at the house of the high priest where Jesus was supposed to have been tried in the Gospel presentation of the death of Jesus. So his son, Josephus says at one point is responsible for the death of James. He called a Sanhedrin together while the Romans were not in the country in, in the antiquity of this is, and uh, had James accused of blasphemy and had him stoned. So I think that you get a series of things leading up to these events uh, that caused these backlashes of violence. To my mind, those are the wicked priests at Cumhun not the Maccabean family. So, Pharisees, these collaborating high priests, and so on and so forth, the Herodian family, all these are supposed to be enemies of Jesus in the New Testament. They're also enemies of the Zealots, also enemies of the Qumran documents. And um, it seems to me that the only problem here is the violence thing. 
Are we, do we have nonviolence in, in uh, Palestine yet? Do we have turning the other cheek yet in Palestine? Do we have render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto, you know, God what is God? Is this going on yet in Palestine or isn't it? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's just say that this is his, uh, why he's so upset, why he hates these party chiefs so much. And, um, on my account will include the misfortunes of the deserters, the punishments inflicted upon prisoners, the burning of the temple, despite Caesar's disapproval, he just told us that he burned it, and the number of sacred treasures snatched from the flames. <laughs> yeah, right, the, the sacred treasures they took to Rome and built the Colosseum with, the capture of the entire city, and the signs and wonders that preceded it, the rest of the party chiefs, the number of people enslaved, that's true, and who were sold into slavery, the face that befell them, the way in which the Romans disposed of the last remnants of the war, uh, demolishing the ramparts of every fort and the temple, and then Titus's return to Italy and the triumphal celebration he enjoyed there. All this I have embraced in seven books. To those who took a part in the war and have ascertained the facts, that I have left no ground for complaint or criticism. It is for those who love truth, not those who seek entertainment, that I have written. Anyway, that's his introduction, but let's go into this history. It begins the same place as all the things. At the time when Antiochus Epiphanes was disputing the control of Palestine and Ptolemy the Sixth, dissension broke out among the leading Jews. Uh, Onias, one of the chief priests, forced his way to the top, expelled the sons of Tobias. We have the sons of Tobias mentioned at one point in Maccabees uh, 2, I think. But this is not the same Onias that we uh, heard about who was killed in Antioch. This is another one who fled to Egypt. This was an earlier one, even. And actually built a second Jewish temple in a place called Heliopolis, like the first one in Jerusalem. That's in the first paragraph here. Why does he begin with the temple, the second Jewish temple, built by one of these Zadokite priests, let's call them Sadducee, before they were Herodianized? Why does he start with that? Because he's going to end the Jewish war. <coughs> With the people who, is, who don't go to Masada, other Sicarii escape to Egypt. The Romans pursue them to Egypt and North Africa, and there they butcher all of them that, that they can find. And they also burn the temple in Egypt, in which the Sicarii took uh, refuge in Egypt. So he ends the Jewish war with the Romans going down into Egypt, chasing the Sicarii and burning the temple there. That's why he starts by mentioning it here. Okay, let's go on here. Mattathias, uh, son of Asmonius, a priest of the village of Modiin. Okay, so that's Maccabees 1 exactly. Five sons fled to the hills, etc., 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 etc. This will be very telescope compared to Maccabees 1. Um, he achieved supremacy in that way, and with the expulsion of the foreigners, his countrymen gladly accepted his rule. And on his decease, he left to Judas, his eldest son. Well, that's Maccabees 1, exactly, but, you know, collapsed into one sentence. Judas did not expect Antiochus to take this uh, peacefully, uh, so he had to uh, marshal the available Jewish forces, and he allied himself with Rome. We had some correspondence in Maccabees 1 with the, with the Romans. In any case, he took possession of the temple, cleansed the whole area, walled it round, made some new ceremonial vessels, threw out the old ones which were defiled, built another altar, resumed the, altar, resumed the sacrifice. What is Judas here? How is he functioning? He's like a high priest. And we know that the Maccabean books say that they are legitimate priestly lines. So I don't see any problem in terms of this being an unpopular priest. So I think it was extremely popular. In the Antiquities, he mentions that Judas is elected high priest twice. So we have election there. So that's a more detailed account. The Antiquities includes things the war doesn't include, like John the Baptist, like James, like things like that. And uh, the reason is, I think by 96, when the Antiquities we know was written, Josephus felt more comfortable in his situation, probably uh, wrongly so, because I think uh, by saying too much in the Antiquity, he probably did himself in. Okay, he had a brother who fell victim to the pro-Syrian party, and then he gets on to Jonathan, tried to secure the friendship of Rome, the next brother. He was treacherously imprisoned. If you can't follow me, do your best. 
Uh, and then Simon took over, avenged the murder of Jonathan. Simon's conduct of affairs was most efficient. Maccabees won. And we've also collapsed 30 years of history, too. So all of Simon's big success. So brilliant was his victory that he was appointed high priest, and after 107 years of Macedonian control, gave the Jews their freedom. So he gives Simon credit for this. The Maccabees one says Simon was elected to the high priesthood by the people, but later on it mentions that the Seleucids also sent him an appointment there. He too was victim of a plot. He was assassinated at a banquet uh, by his uh, son-in-law, and two of his sons were killed, and the third son, John Hyrcanus, escaped. Now, I told you at one point, I'll tell you again, that because Simon was at a banquet, the official scroll theorists say at one point in the scrolls, the wicked priest is described as drinking his fill. And therefore, it's in the Habakkuk commentary. And therefore, they say, it must be Simon Maccabee or one of these people who is the wicked priest because he was a drunkard. The wicked priest actually drinks his fill of the cup of the wrath of God for what he did to the righteous teacher. He's not drinking alcohol. He's drinking divine vengeance. It's in the Revelation book, as I told you, in two places. And it says, And a second angel, line 14a, followed him, calling Babylon the greatest form. We know in Revelation, Babylon is supposed to be Rome. Babylon, which gave the whole world the wine of God's anger to drink. That is the imagery of the death of the, righteous, of, of the wicked priest in the scrolls. And a third angel followed and shouted, all those who worship the beast and his statue and have themselves branded on the head of the fort will be made to drink the wine of God's fury, which is ready undiluted in the cup of his anger. And uh, that's exactly the imagery of the Habakkuk pressure on the death of the righteous teacher. But here it is in column 11. Habakkuk is talking about woe to the one who causes his neighbor to drink, pouring out his fury into his drunkenness. Its interpretation concerns the wicked priest who pursued the righteous teacher in order to swallow him in his hot anger. That is the wicked priest's hot anger. And then it goes on to have a You are satiated with shame than with shame more with shame than glory. Drink and stagger. For the cup of the right hand of the Lord will come around to you, and shame will cover your glory. This concerns the wicked priest whose shame was greater than his glory. And he walked in the way of satiety, of, well, that's what they say, of drunkenness, but the cup of the wrath of God will swallow him. That is, he will drink his fill of the cup of the wrath of God. And he did this for, because of what he did to the righteous teacher and what he did to the poor, the followers of the righteous teacher. And, you know, the followers of James and early Christianity are called Ebionites. Here in this document, the poor are the Ebionim. I mean, this says almost on its very face that this is an Ebionite doc document. The reason that the followers of James and early Christianity are called the Ebionites is because they were called the poor. And the followers of the righteous teacher here in the Habakkuk Pesher are called the poor. Anyway, we won't go ahead like that. I just want to show you that um, Simon, he was attacked at a bank and banquet and killed. Anyway, um, so John was very successful, Hyrcanus. He had 33 years of administration. He died leaving uh, five sons. And he had the three greatest privileges at once, political power, high priesthood, and prophetic gift. So he had been appointed high priest at one point in the uh, Maccabee books, I think, uh, or he was appointed king uh, by the Seleucids, and he also had the high priesthood. He, he says here, that Aristobulus, his oldest son, was the first to wear the crown. But we have in the Maccabee books that the Jonathan had the crown before him. Uh, Aristobulus, as we see here, is the oldest son of uh, John Hyrcanus, but he doesn't last long. He falls out with his uh, younger brother, the two squabble, I forget what happens to them, but they both die in the process. In any case, uh, uh, along the way here, an Essene is mentioned. This is around 100 B.C. Judas, an Essene born and bred, 
was never mistaken in any of his predictions. On this occasion, when he saw Antigonus pass through the temple, he called out to his acquaintance, pupils that were with him, Oh God, the best thing is that I should die. Uh, there lies Antigonus, who has to have been killed today. In any case, Antigonus is the next oldest son of John Hyrcanus. These two older sons die in some way. I forget how. But he mentions Judas the Essene. It's the first we have of any Essene mentioned. This is around 100 BC. But I don't think this is an Essene. The same way that Pharisee Hasidans are confused with Zadokai Hasidans, I think this is a Pharisee. And Essene, the word Essene, I think comes from the, from the word uh, Hasidan, originally. Probably originally, no one knows what Essene comes from. People think it has to do with piousness in Aramaic. It isn't clear. Nobody knows what the word Essene comes from. But it's mentioned for the first time. But what is he? He's just a, a fortune-telling sort of sycophant hanging around the temple. Well, as we'll find, these fortune-telling people like Josephus himself later on, who predicts Vespasian's rise to power, these sycophants are mostly Pharisees. So I don't think this is a real pure Essene here. Though, he is mentioned as it is. Alexander's wife is mentioned here. Um, her name is um, Salome Alexander. She's mentioned in the scrolls at one point. But it's in a, a, another document that's just very um, fragmentary. Uh, it also mentions the conqueror of the uh, temple in 63 BC and um, just very fragmentary, and again, it looks like past events are being mentioned. But it's clear that Alexander married his pre his brother's wife, who was this Salome Alexander, after his brother died. So Alexander was the youngest of the three brothers. He survived. And the point is that this Salome Alexander, her brother was this Simeon Ben Shetta. And uh, so he is in the rabbinic literature, one of the Pharisee pairs that leads down to Rabbi Yochanan and others. So this is a very important Pharisee family that she comes from. And she really has a lot of influence. She outlives Alexander too. So here we get the problem of Alexander from 100 to about 70 BC um, having to fight uh, this Demetrius, who has been invited into the country, who had beaten Alexander, after fleeing to the hills, Alexander was joined by 6,000 Jews. So once again, like Judas, two generations later, Alexander takes to the hills, and uh, it looks like there's a Qumran document also mentioning him at one point. Uh, again, these are probably later uh, documents, uh, PN to King Jonathan which shows that the Qumran people like this guy. They write a pen to him, a poem of praise. So they obviously seem to, so the, the Maccabeans and the scrolls cannot be the wicked priests in the way it is uh, supposedly theorized by most Dead Sea Scroll experts. So the whole nation therefore changed their minds and flocked to his standards and he is able to keep independence and expel the Seleucids for the time being. But he was so uh, enraged that the, he proceeded to impiety from brutality. That's what the Nahum Pesher says about the furious young, young lion. He was impious in this act. 800 prisoners he impaled in the middle of the city, crucified if you like, hung up alive, then butchered their wives and children before their eyes. Now that is a pretty atrocious event, but he was really worked up about uh, the treachery and so on and so forth. So, that's Alexander Yanias. He died after reigning 27 years. But his wife, Alexandra, succeeds him still. Here is where the Herodians are going to be introduced. Here is where the Pharisees are going to be in introduced. Uh, and here is the tragic moment for Jewish national independence. Here is where the Romans are going to come into the picture. So, Alexandra... Confident that the Jews would readily submit to her, she had an extraordinary reputation for piety. 
She was very particular in her observance of national custom, meaning national law. Of the two sons she bore Alexander, she appointed the elder Hyrcanus high priest. As the younger Aristobulus, who was more impulsive, she kept out of public eye. Sort of like the Old Testament, the youngers always supplant the olders. It turns out that Aristobulus is the popular person. We're around 70, 60s BC. The Romans are expanding, as you know, since the days of Daniel in the Eastern Mediterranean. Pompeii and the triumvirate is coming down through Turkey or Asia Minor and Syria. Uh, so what happens here? Um, but while she ruled others, the Pharisees ruled her. There you are. She's a Pharisee puppet or whatever. And the Pharisees are now mentioned by name. Thus, an eminent man who was a friend of Alexander was put to death by them on the charge of having abetted the king of impaling 800 citizens. You see, the Pharisees are taking vengeance on the associates of Alexander. They then pressed Alexander to execute the rest of those who had incited Alexander against them. So it definitely is the Pharisees who Alexander executes. And who, who also, by implication, invited foreign power, Demetrius, into the country, the same way the previous ones had done in Alchemist's time. This we'll find is typical of the Pharisee behavior. Later on in 37 BC, when Herod uh, comes, the Pharisees recommend opening the gates to Herod. When the war against Rome begins, the Pharisees invite the Roman troops into the city. This is repeated over and over again. It is not the popular way, because the popular way is the resistance way. It is the way of survival. Josephus calls himself a Pharisee. Paul calls himself a Pharisee. Everyone calls himself a Pharisee who wants to survive, but it is not the resistance way. Now, Aristobulus seizes his chance, and he had many followers, all devoted to him because of his impulsive character. Read charismatic character. He's popular. They don't like Hyrcanus, who they see as a collaborator. And they met in battle near Jericho, but the bulk of Hyrcanus' army deserted into Aristobulus. That tells you who the popular person is, Aristobulus because he's the nationalist Sadducee, if you want to call him that. He's the nationalist. Fear sees the enemies of Aristobulus when he so unexpectedly triumphed. Most of all, and here he is, Antipater, the father of Herod, who Aristobulus long detested. He was by race an Inuman, there it is, and ancestry and wealth and other sources of strength made him the natural leader of his nation, that is, of the Inuman nation, not the Jewish nation. He advised Hyrcanus to seek the protection of Aretas, king of Arabia. That is the other branch of his family. He's connected to the king in Petra across Jordan. So now, coming in from Syria is Scaurus, who was sent down from Armenia by Pompey the Great. And learning how things were in Judea, lost no time in seizing the heaven-sent opportunity. This is that the Jews invited the Romans into the country? That's total nonsense. And who brought him in? Herod's father was the intermediary. This is how Herod is going to gain control in Palestine. By destroying the Maccabean family, the first one he destroys is this Aristobulus. And then by, by parlaying a governorship into a, into, a, into a kingship appointed by the Romans. The Herodians are never the Jewish kings. They're an interloper family that the Romans impose upon the Jews. No one who reads the New Testament knows this. It's caused so much grief and uh, uh, so much anti-Semitism, actually, uh, that I do my little best to try to write the picture because it's wrong. Even Jews believe it. They don't know. Jews don't read this. They haven't read this for 2,000 years. But look at what the key moment is. So uh, Aretas uh, wants Hyrcanus to go and uh, debase himself before Pompey and Scourus. Uh, on, on Aristobulus' side, Presented himself decked out in all his royal splendor, but he turned sick of servility and could not bear to abase himself in order to secure the ends of the cost of his dignity. So at this place, Diosopolis, he turned back. So Aristobulus will not debase himself to Pompey. He returns. His followers hold out in Jerusalem. The Pharisees and Hyrcanus associate themselves with Pompey. They come in with the Roman army. And... Um, 
the supporters of, of Aristobulus um, call for war to rescue the king who had been illegally later arrested by the Romans on a ploy when he came out to negotiate with them, while the others invite the Romans into the city. They're the Pharisees. Now, Pompey himself was busy filling in the trench and so on and so forth. While the Romans were suffering severely, Pompey was amazed at the unshakable endurance of the Jews, especially their maintenance of their religious ceremonies in the midst of a storm of missiles. These are Zadokai priests. These will all be butchered. Not even when the temple was being captured and they were being butchered around the altar did they abandon their ceremonies, putting the service of God before their own preservation. That's Maccabees 2. Most of those who fell were killed by their own countrymen of the rival faction, the Pharisees, etc., etc. Uh, Pompey went into the inner sanctum of the temple and he saw the lampstead, the lamp, the table, uh, but he touched nothing, which is interesting because according to the scrolls, the Kittim take the booty back to where they came from. So this is clearly not this particular assault here. Uh, he appointed Hyrcanus high, high priest again because he had shown himself most helpful during the siege, yes, especially by holding off the crowds of country folk anxious to fight for Aristobulus. Oh, I can't read you anymore, we have to stop there. But that is basically the situation that we're going to have. The Romans take over, Hyrcanus uh, survives for a while, then Herod in the next generation gets the governorship of Galilee, maneuvers himself into marrying uh, um, Hyrcanus' niece, this Miriam I told you about, and then ultimately executes her, ultimately even executes Hyrcanus, executes her mother, executes her children by him, executes her brother, executes the whole Maccabean family.